please pray with me? Almighty God, we come before you with thankful hearts. We know who we are, and we know who you are, for you have made these things known to us. We are in so many ways outcasts, outsiders, like Orpah, Ruth, Naomi, the Samaritan woman, and the ten lepers. By virtue of our sin, we have no place in the family. But in your great mercy, you have brought us in and given us a place in the family. More than that, you keep us firm as your people. Guide us now as your spirit gives us ears to hear, soft hearts to believe, and resolute minds to live thankful lives before you and our neighbor. In Jesus' name, amen. Dear friends in Christ, the lessons this morning speak to us about being outcasts. Being an outcast is never a popular experience. It is something we know as well. Maybe outcast seems a little harsh. Think of it this way. If not outcasts, then certainly outsiders. Perhaps we resonate with that better. That is, outsiders instead of outcasts. Regardless, the dynamic is similar. The 1995 movie, A Walk in the Clouds, tells the story of World War II veteran Paul Sutton, a combat veteran having difficulty settling into civilian life. He's reduced to selling chocolates on the road, monetizing his veteran status. Struggling in a loveless wartime marriage, Paul meets Victoria Aragon, who is returning in shame to her traditional Mexican family, pregnant, unmarried, and having dropped out of college. She's terrified of the reception she'll get from her father, Alberto, at the family vineyard in Napa, California. In an impetuous moment of kindness, Paul offers to play the part of her husband and the father of the baby to blunt her father's judgment. He will abandon her shortly after in a ploy to mitigate her outcast situation. Victoria's father, Alberto, is the head of a proud, many-generation local family of status and wealth. He's chagrined to discover that Victoria has gotten married on the sly. He has little regard for her husband, Paul, thinking she is definitely married beneath herself. When, she meet, when he meets Paul, he is shocked to learn that Paul is not only unimportant, and common, but an orphan. His shock changes to offense and then abuse. His biting words of recrimination and rejection are, my daughter can trace her ancestors back 400 years to some of the finest families in Mexico, and you're telling me she's married a man with no past? Or worse, a man with no past and no future. Assuming that he's stuck with Paul as a handicap of a son-in-law, Victoria's father continues to berate him, always assuming the worst of him. When fired, fiery tragedy strikes the family vineyard, all is lost, or so it seems. But it is Paul himself that plucks a future hope from the smoldering disaster. Despite being an orphan and treated as an outcast, Paul demonstrates character and grit beyond his circumstances. After proving himself to the family as a hardworking man of honor, Paul finds a place in the family. Victoria's grandfather, Don Pedro, played by Anthony Quinn, states the joyful reality, you are an orphan no more. This fictional situation is really not all that fictional. Oh, the story is fiction. Life reminds us often of outcasts and outsiders. Juxtaposed are those who are important and insiders. We know this from our own lives. There are often two groups of people in life. They are insiders and outsiders, those in favor and those out of favor, the haves and have-nots, family and others, Jews and Gentiles, Pharisees and sinners, the question is, where do you fit in? Or better yet, where do you find yourselves? Because not fitting in is the thing, isn't it? 
Join me in considering the accounts of Moabites, widows, Samaritans, and lepers, and we ourselves. The Moabites were famously outsiders and outcasts in the ancient world, not least from the perspective of the people of Israel. Consider some facts about the Moabites in the Bible. Abraham's nephew Lot settled in Sodom and Gomorrah. We know the story of Sodom's destruction, Lot's deliverance, Lot's salty wife, that's familiar to us, as is the relationship of Lot and his two daughters. You might remember that the first child of this incestuous union was Moab. Talk about raw material for being an outcast. The Moabites were related to the Jews, but at a distance and with disgrace. They are the cousins you never want to talk about. Even worse, the Moabites were continually a thorn in the side of the Israelites. The Moabite women ensnared the Israelite men with sexual immorality and led them into a false religion. The Israelite men followed their lead like cattle to the slaughter. Not just any false religion. The preferred religion was the worship of Chemosh, who required human sacrifice. Talk about an outcast part of the family. And remember this. Ruth was a Moabite. The Samaritans were also out of favor with, with the Israelites. The Samaritans were family, and perhaps, perhaps not as horrible as the Moabites, but still the black sheep of the family. A good Jew really didn't want to acknowledge them or do much with them if he could help it. The Samaritans were related through the line of Joseph's sons, the half-tribes of Manash and Ephraim. The Samaritans stayed behind in the land of Israel when Israel and Judah went into exile in Assyria, which doesn't, and that didn't foster fond relations. When the Jews returned to the land, the Samaritans were there claiming, hey, possessions nine-tenths of the law. The Samaritans also denounced Judaism at the time of Antiochus Epiphanes in order to avoid persecution, betrayal of family, not the way to be recognized as a loved and respected part of the family. Additionally, although the Samaritans retained much of the worship form of the Jews, they changed two things substantially. They insisted on worship upon Mount Gerizim instead of Mount Zion, and they only considered the first five books of the Old Testament as fully scripture. The rest were secondary at best. In our own church lives, we know that change what you want and I will overlook it. Change how I worship and my Bible, that's another matter altogether. The widows, we have to consider them. Those like Naomi and Ruth suffered in popular opinion in the ancient world. They were considered under God's disfavor. If God had taken a husband from them, then they must have done something really bad because God doesn't punish without good reason, or so some would have said. Such a circumstance was taken to be a sign of God's displeasure and just punishment. If a widow was barren, without children, especially sons, she was doubly disadvantaged. She had no husband to care for and no sons to provide in lieu of a husband. She was bereft, all alone in the world, with none to provide. Naomi had not been barren, but in our Old Testament reading, she had no living husband or sons left and could find herself at the mercy of dishonest and merciless men of power. She was functionally a barren widow and was politely outcast by those who counted in society. What about the lepers? They were perhaps the epitome of outcasts, for they were cast out of society with extreme prejudice. They were accounted as unclean and feared for being transmitters of contagion. Their unclean status meant that many of daily occurrences in, in the life of a clean person enjoy, that a clean person enjoyed were withheld from them, including they had to live in isolation from community and family. The only community they could be part of was the community of other leprous outcasts. They were required to wear particular garments that effectively served as uniforms to identify them as lepers. 
They were under restraining orders to keep their distance from anybody that was not a leper. This included wife and husband, sons and daughters, grandchildren, anyone. They had to loudly announce their approaching presence with the ringing of bells and the shouts of, unclean, unclean, so that others could properly avoid them. They had to live as cultic outcasts, meaning that they couldn't participate in the cultus, the worship life of the people. To use our phrases, they couldn't go to church, participate in worship, receive the sacraments, or anything else. They were cut off from the church, and most insiders assumed that because these outsiders could not effectively keep the third commandment, that is, to keep the Sabbath day holy, they were cut off from God. Conventional wisdom assumed that the lepers were being punished by God for moral failures in their lives. Lepers were totally outcast, personally, socially, economically, from the family, religiously, physically, and emotionally. Talk about being alone. Talk about being outsiders, outcasts on all levels. The question then turns to how about you? What is the nature of your outcast status? Oh, you have one, make no mistake. You make reference to it weekly with words like this. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. Let's bring this close to home, this outcast business. Have you ever felt like an outsider? The outcast in a room full of people? Have you felt like you never really fit in? Have others pushed you to the margins of the conversation or of the group or of the family? Does it seem like you're the forgotten one? When the grief of death begins to subside, when time passes since the event, when life moves on for others, but doesn't seem to move on for you. Are you the only one who will still say the name of your lost loved one? You're left behind and alone. Have circumstances in your life pushed you outside the circle? Perhaps your own sin has made a pariah of you, the bitter fruit of ill-conceived rash choices. Or maybe it's been the collateral sin of others that have alienated or isolated you. After all, didn't we learn in Luther's small catechism that the jealous holiness of God even brings hardship to the third and fourth generation, generations of those who hate God? We are outcasts. You are outcast. You are your own version of a Moabite, a Samaritan, a widow, a leper, I'm sorry to tell you this, but you already know it, and the truth hurts. We see ourselves all too well in the faces of these groups of outcasts in the lessons this morning. But what to do, what can be done? Better yet, what can God do? How did God deal with the Moabites? God dealt with the Moabites by giving them also the promises of his covenant. The promise was even for the children of incest and their children and their children and their children. They knew of the promises to Abram and the parents of the Moabites, Lot and his daughter, were saved from destruction. God made possible inclusion in the family of God's mercy, even for them. The believing Moabites, like Ruth, lived and worshiped as ones loved by Yahweh. Ruth herself became a model of devotion, despite the outcast status she bore. Indeed, Ruth became an epitome of Yahweh's redemptive mercy, herself being a great grandmother of King David and eventually the ancestor of the Savior, Jesus Christ. How did God deal with the widows? God dealt with the widows in mercy and acceptance. He protected them, provided for them, and set their frailties, worries, and sins on the cross with his son. They experienced his favor and blessing. 
The Psalms recount this grace of God to widows and the barren. Psalm 113, verse 9, he settles the childless woman in her home as a happy mother of children. Psalm 68, verse 8, God settles the lonely in families. He leads the prisoners out to prosperity. And Psalm 107, verse 41, he lifts the needs from affliction and increases their families like flocks. Remember, even the Virgin Mary was a widow, for Joseph seems to be absent from the life of Jesus sometime in his early adulthood. Indeed, from the cross, Jesus had to entrust her to the care of John, the son of Zebedee. Man, behold your mother. Woman, behold your son, were Jesus' words. How did God deal with the Samaritans? God dealt with the Samaritans as people he loved and sought. Jesus himself did not avoid the Samaritans. In a time when a good, pious Jew would take the long way around across the Jordan rather than traverse through Samaria when going north or south in Israel, Jesus made a point of going straight through Samaria. The exchange with the woman at the well in John 4 is a great example of that very intentional practice of Jesus. He spoke to that woman in such a way that honored her as one whom he would call. The woman at the well was a keen evangelist to her previously estranged neighbors in Sychar. The faithful, thankless, the faithful thankfulness of the Samaritan leper in our gospel reading demonstrated that Jesus' interaction with these unruly relatives resulted in faith and that faith resulted in good works. The thankful leper shouted the praises of Jesus who had shown compassion and love. How did Jesus deal with the lepers? Jesus dealt with the lepers in such dramatic fashion to show them that, show them that they were loved by him. Though they were devalued by others, rejected, scorned, marginalized, and even vilified. They were valued by him, esteemed by him. He healed them of their horrible infirmity, but didn't stop with the clinical. He dealt in mercy with their other hurts and needs, emotional, relational, spiritual. He thereby restored them from outcast status to regular, social, worshiping members of the community. He gave them what they thought they had lost, never to be regained. Now the question becomes, how does God deal with you? God deals with you in mercy, with compassion, in the forgiveness of sins, and the restoration of that which was lost by sin and sinfulness. The promise of God in Jesus Christ is not just for Moabites. It's for you. Your sin is forgiven. Your status is no longer outcast. The provision of God is not just for Ruth and Naomi, it's for you. When there is no one to stand for you, to provide for you, to take up your defense, there is the righteous one who has made you his. The call and compassion of Jesus is not just for an immoral woman at the well, it is for you. He knows your sin and lack of morality let he loves you st yet he loves you still. The touch of compassion, the healing of sickness, the restoration of the church is not just for a leper, it is for you. When all are against you, he is for you. Indeed, he is for you at great cost, his own life and death, the forsaking of his only begotten son. Those cast out from society and family of others can know the compassion of Jesus. We saw it today in our lessons. We know it to be true in our own lives. Lepers restored to their families in the community. Widows experienced the joy of relationship rekindled where it had been lost. Moabites were brought into the full family in spite of generations of immorality. Samaritans sought out by the Savior and were giving, given living water. Lutherans forgiven again for sins committed, alienation from those who have wronged or been wronged, 
those born outside the family of God and reborn to be children of God. Like Paul Sutton, an orphan, who hears the comforting, the comforting words of Don Pedro, you are an orphan no more. Please pray with me. Almighty God, you restore the lost, you heal the afflicted, you comfort the mourning, you put the lonely into families. You have done this for us, you have done this for me. Give me lips to sing your praises and a thankful heart. In Jesus' name, amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.